Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the Medical Imaging Institute by Gerbe. What an amazing year we have lined up for you, and we're so grateful you have all been a part of our lives and sharing our journey in education and knowledge sharing. Today, we'll be talking about power injectors and central venous catheters, principles, techniques, and applications. So just a few housekeeping rules. The lecture will go for about 45 minutes. We'll have 15 minutes of Q&A and we will provide the certificate of attendance after two weeks after the webinar and after you have completed the actual feedback form at the end. We are accredited by the ISRRT, which is the International Society of Radiographers and Radiologic Technologists, the ASRT, the American Society of Radiologic Technologists, the Society of the Radiographers in the UK, and the Australian Society of Medical Imaging and Radiation Therapy. So just a disclaimer, all GERBAY product indications are as per approved by the country's regulatory authorities. So please refer to your local SMPC or contact the local GERBAY team if you need further product information. And of course, my name is Dr. Shab El Saadi. I'm the uh, Clinical Education Director for Gerbe Global. And everything we do, we do it through advancing in knowledge sharing. Here is another disclaimer. Now, this is a very challenging lecture that we're going to give today. And more importantly, this will actually show us that every institution in the world will have a different practice. So please follow your institution's guidelines on contrast media delivery via lines and always consult a radiologist and or nurse prior to injection. This presentation is only based on publications which may not be appropriate in your country or institution. And this is only an educational session on injection techniques. So please always go back and refer to your local guidelines this is only an educational webinar. I must stress the importance of this disclaimer. So we'll be talking about the types of central venous catheters, the chest termogram. Now, funny enough, what is really interesting here is that a lot of times we can see issues with our central lines before injecting. And of course, we'll look at some contrast media delivery techniques and we'll look at complications. So let's look at the types of central venous catheters. The performance of the CVC is directly related to the position of the catheter tip. As suboptimal tip position increases the risk for catheter-related complications, including dysfunction of the CVC, arrhythmia, venous thrombosis, and venous erosion. What does this mean? If your catheter is not placed in the right place within the chest, then you're also potentially putting that patient at risk. We're gonna show you how to assess this. So normally, if we just take a look here, does the patient have you know, venous uh, access for the contrast injection? If it has peripheral, of course, you can go 22 or 20 gauge catheter, depending on your uh, examination type. So if it's a CTA or it's a normal post-contrast CT, you could use 20 gauge, or if you want to go standard 22 gauge for standard routine injections. But again, this must come back to what is approved in your institution. If there's no venous uh, access, then of course you can pop a cannula in, or if you've tried multiple times, then you can go through ultrasound. Otherwise, you have another option, the central venous catheter or portacath. If there is one, the radio, radiology RN is to identify if the catheter is power injectable. Not all catheters are power injectable. This is something to remember. And, and usually it's written power pick, okay? If there is one, then again, and if it's not a power pick, but the radiologist still wants you to inject in that central line, the, the next thing you need to do then is you need to go in and check the catheter's documents to see maximum pressure, if they allow injection, if or is it hand injection, what they can and can't do. So be very careful. This is really an important uh, item to pay attention to. 
And so when you're looking at the types of catheters, there are a few types. There's the tunneled central venous catheter, also known as Hickman's, uh, Groschong, or Broviac. Okay, you have the central venous catheters, which is a subcutaneously injected. So again, this is, we'll go through that in more detail. And then you have your PIC, or your peripherally inserted central catheter. So basically, the advantages of a tunneled central venous catheter has long durations to stay in there and lower risk of infection and thrombosis. And this is usually with patients that are cancer patients and they're re receiving chemotherapy through it. Now, what's really important is there are limitations. You know, it's higher cost and there's also limited flow. That's why you've got to be careful whether you do a hand injection or if you're going to do a mechanical injection. But again, you need to go back to these individual catheters that's in there, identify them correctly and check their SMPCs. If you look at the CVC lines, again, there's low risk of infection and thrombosis. This is really good for insertion needles uh, in radiology, surgery, anesthesia. And also, this does need uh, special training and equipment for nurses to access. So this is something that not anybody can do. It is a high cost. There is limited flows. And it needs a six-week flushing with heparin locking. A lot of lines will have a heparin lock. What does this mean? The actual heparin will be inside the catheter to prevent it from clotting or anything happening. So if you inject directly in there, you're going to give a big bolus of heparin into the patient. So you need to be really careful that we don't touch these lines at all. It's only by the registered nurse who is equipped to do it and the radiologist. And of course, you have your pick lines. Um, this can last, it can last in your body for months. It's easy to insert and remove, and it's lower cost. And again, this has been taken um, from a paper that was published in 2022. Now, if we have a look at the typical non-tunneled uh, CVC, you can actually see it's coming down here in, through the SVC, and it should be sitting and landing in the right area. I'm not going to tell you right yet where the right area is to land, but I will show you how it looks like. If you have a tunneled CVC, these are usually quite thicker and they have quite a large volume of fluid that can be delivered at any point in time. Then you also have the porter cath. Now, what's interesting here is that if you look at, you know, the Smith Bard or Angiodynamics, it's a subcutaneous end-dwelling CVC. Port. This is FDA approved for power injection. So again, sometimes when you go back to the SMPC, you need to ensure and make sure that it is FDA approved for power injection. Also, it has very distinctive scalloped edges that can be seen on a chest X-ray, as you can see here. But more importantly, the connection between these lines and the portocath, sometimes they can be dislodged. So sometimes you will inject contrast, but then it's injecting into this area and not into the line. That is why the tomogram is key when you're looking at this. And of course, it can be indicated for a power injection of up to five mils a second with a 300 PSI setting. Again, you need to go back and determine the type uh, of the catheter that you're using and the SMPC. And of course, if the MRI can dish or, or not. And here is another one, which is a, a pick line, which is typically will come in from either the left side or right side. It will cross through the brachiocephalic vein down into the SVC and will land into this area. Now, I will talk about landing in a moment. And again, when you're looking at power picks, there are two types of pick lines. There's the standard pick line or there is the power pick line. Usually the power pick lines are purple and it's actually written and we'll show you some images and it says power pick and everything as well. Now, if you also look at Bard, Cook, uh, Morpheus access systems, the power pick is purple. We've discussed that and they're FDA approved for power injection of contrast in adults and children. And usually a power pick is of four French single lumen or five French single or double lumen and potentially six French single or double lumen as well. And that can be ejected up to five mils a second. But interestingly, think about this. If I already have the tip of my catheter sitting just at the right atrium, that means the time the blood contrast is moving through my upper extremity in my venous system going into my right atrium, dilution is low. 
So I could potentially go lower flow rates and so forth. So let's have a look at the chest thermogram. So here, this is exactly how it works. So if I look here at my axillary veins, the brachycephalic vein into the SVC, my internal jugular vein, and my SVC is this red area here. And my blue or my light blue area is my right atrium. Now here we have the circle or the purple circle, which is actually seen to be as the carina. Where should the tip of any catheter, indwelling catheter be, especially on the, in the heart? It should be at what they call is the cavo arterial junction. And this is basically two vertebra below the carina. So when you're looking at your thermogram, the whole point is identify your uh, carina. And then from the carina, you go down two vertebral bodies. So we've got one here, two there. This is the cavo arterial junction. And this is the exact spot and location where it should be. Now, if I look at these zones, if I'm at the aortocaval junction, this is the optimal zone if I'm a centimeter above or centimeter below. But if I'm too high up in the SVC, this is suboptimal, then your contrast delivery might be affected because maybe the line is in, uh, affected. Here, again, if it's too much into the right atrium, again, this can be a suboptimal zone and this could be also problematic for you. So this is why whenever, you know, they insert lines up in the intensive care unit or in the wards, they call you for a portable chest X-ray. It's important to get there as soon as possible in order to start their medication because if the tip is not in the right area, this can then cause further irritation to either the heart. So you inject contrast or drugs into the right atrium directly. It's a high bolus. It causes irritation. And normally you can see this when they're feeding the actual central line in or the pick line, the heart begins to change its, um, its you know, systolic and diastolic uh, beats. So let's take a look at a few contrast media delivery techniques. Now we know, you know doctors, nurses and, and technologists, radiographers, they can insert proof for catheters if you are accredited by your institution. And of course, normally for all CTA injections, it is always ideal to use the right cubital fossa because it's the closest to the heart and always use a 20 gauge because you can go up to five mils a second. But again, here I will ask you, please check your SMPC on even your catheters that are being inserted because different types of gauges will have different pressures and allowable flow rates. If you're looking at a small peripheral line, like a 24 gauge, this can only be used for a hand injection because you can't use a power injector even at a very, very slow flow rate. And of course, before um, initiating the injection, make sure you get good venous backflow. So you get your needle into the catheter, you draw it back. And this is just in peripheral intravenous lines into your arms. But again, I will say, please follow your institution's guidelines and contrast media delivery via lines and always consult a radiologist or nurse prior to injection. The last thing you ever wanna do is give an injection into a central line or any line and it hasn't been checked or you're not equipped to do it, you're putting your patient at risk. So please be careful of this. So what is the criteria for a power injection? Well, it's, it's very simple. The CVC must be verified as compatible for power injection, which we've spoken about before. A trained radiology nurse, doctor, or radiology technologist or radiographer will help the imaging technologist connect, connect it to the line, depending, again, on your institution's protocols. The five rights for med medication administration are satisfied. So checking the right patient, the right side, the right contrast media, the right dose, and the right route, and the right time. Do a visual inspection of all external portions of the catheters for integrity and proper positioning. So... There's no kinks in there. Um, it's not been in there too long and so forth. And of course, the maximum flow rate and PSI for adult injection is five mils a second at less than 300 PSI. Now, let me tell you another thing that's important here. Different types of contrast media in CT and MRI can have different viscosity profiles. So this is going to affect your pressure and your injector performance. So be very careful of this as well. If you wanted to do a hand injection uh, through a, um, a PIC line or a venous catheter, of course, the 
The radiology nurse will determine the catheter type and size by visual inspection and review of documentation. Now, I'm really sorry I've been repeating myself on every slide multiple times, but this is something really, really important to pay attention to. Hand injection is acceptable if it does not need a CTA uh, uh, acquisition or technique. Adult patients with non-power injectable central lines may undergo contrast injection for CT and MRI hand injection into the CVC except into dialysis catheters. Now, here, be careful. Sometimes you can, uh, a vascular cath, they can be used, but this is also can be quite problematic for diabetic patients. Of course, um, a trained radiology nurse or MD will perform the hand injection per protocol followed by 10 mil of uh, a normal saline flush, and of course, do the visual in inspection and the five rights for medication administration. Do not use dialysis catheters because dialysis, dialysis catheters are not to be used with the exception of the barred trialysis catheter as described below because the barred trialysis catheter has a power injectable third lumen, okay, which is the power pick right there. Okay, and only this lumen may be used for contrast administration. And the maximum flow rate is marked on the lumen. So here you can actually see five mils a second max. But generally worldwide, you don't need anything more than 4.5 mils a second. And you would have seen in our webinars last year in cardiac CTA, anything more than that, you start to affect the flow of contrast and the stroke volume coming out of the heart. And then, of course, sometimes you're going to have an internal jugular vein catheter. We have to be realistic because they don't have a central line. They've tried under ultrasound. They don't time, have time to have a pick line. These short IV cannulas can be used but should not be power injected by the technologist or nurse because of the dangers of extravasation in the neck. So here, if you wanted to do an injection, you should call for the radiologist or the trained nurse to do the injection by hand only. Otherwise, this is a very sensitive area and you can't afford to have an extravasation or any uh, problem there and you want to reduce the risk as much as possible. And when you're looking at vascular opacification, you know, again, we're looking at patient characteristics, so weight, height, cardiac output, age, scanner parameters. You know, now with iterative reconstruction, we can start using more 180 kVp, even 70 kVp techniques for smaller patients with a BMI of 21, for example. And of course, when you're looking at contrast media parameters, if you're going to have to do a CTA and it's in the internal jugular vein and you have to do a hand injection, again, this is when you're going to have to rethink how you're going to deliver your contrast and how to type. And remember one more thing. If you are injecting into the central line or any line as such, and remember your time to peak is going to get very fast because it's not traveling through the arm anymore. It's directly into the right uh, atrium. So that's why your timing bolus, normally you would wait five seconds for a CTPA or you would wait 10 seconds for a CTA. Now you would start your timing bolus immediately because the contrast is there. And so also when you're looking at, you know, the difference between cubital fossa versus line injection, when I inject in the arm, it's going to, I have to wait so much more longer for the contrast to travel through the venous system to the right side of the heart. Whereas if I'm in the central line, it's immediately here. So again, wait five seconds. Uh, don't wait five seconds for CTPA. You start straight away. For CTA, you start straight away because the contrast is already in the right atrium. And remember the typical, you know, holy grail of imaging for CTA. For every 10 kVp you drop, you're reducing your radiation dose by 16%. If you do nothing else, you increase your vessel density because you're closer to the cage of contrast by 25%. And you increase your contrast to noise by 15%. And if we'll have a look, now this is interesting. Now this was a study that was done on cardiac and coronary CTA, a worldwide study. Uh, we're talking about more than 10,000 patients. And we know that the KH of contrast media for CT is sitting at about 33.2 kilo electron volts. But then you, you hear a lot of people talking about the KEV. Let's look at where does this fit in terms of image quality. So what they did was 
patients who had less than 100 kvp on their cardiac scans, this was deemed as better image quality. If it was more than 100, it was worse. So that's why anything more than 120 kvp, it's really not good anymore because you don't get the um, K edge of contrast as much as you want. So therefore, whenever you're looking at uh, 100 kvp, if you go to 80, it's even better. And again, make sure you consult uh, your department protocols and look at your weight-based approach. And then when you're looking at blood flow, so normally when we inject in the line, it's only laminar flow. But whenever when we're injecting in the arms or in the legs, if we're doing direct venogram, you're going to get turbulent flow and the cross-sectional area changes. So that's why your contrast media will get to your right atrium very quickly because of its location. And then when you're looking at the viscosity profile of contrast media, again, you see that there is variations due to viscosity. And again, also with osmolality, the higher the osmolality, the greater induced osmotic diuresis and moderately higher osmolality can provide renal protective effects. And then, of course, when you're looking at, you know, hydrophilicity, what's really important here is the hydropatic index is at zero. So the lower the hydropatic index is into the minus area, okay, it can, um, it reduces the impact of the double lipid layer of those cells opening up and having an exchange between contrast and water within the cell. So this is why it may, according to this paper that was published, it may reduce the effects of uh, renal function. And then when you're looking at contrast delivery, just remember faster flow rates are only done to get more contrast into the heart. But with us, because we're going to the central line, you can afford to go half a mil lower. But again, it depends on the allowable flow rate. With a, a lower KVP, and a lower iodine concentration at 350 density, for example, you get a high Hounsford unit. And this is how you increase your opacification profile. And of course, contrast and, contrast and saline. The more saline you use, so use two syringes. The first one is your contrast. Use less contrast. Use more saline. When you use those two syringes, it gives you way better image quality. And then, of course, whenever you're looking at bolus tracking versus test bolus, bolus tracking, this is where you have to have a predetermined volume of contrast. And that is what you're giving to the patient. But if you did a test bolus technique, and we'll show you a few techniques in a moment, you'll be able to use the exact amount of contrast that you need. Again, you're putting one extra step in your workflow, which is an extra minute, but the savings on contrast is quite a lot. And in actual fact, to accommodate for your saline push, this will allow you to use two syringes and your second saline to push that through and to maintain a pacification profile. So whenever you're looking at bolus tracking or test bolus, we don't worry about monitoring here because you're not going to see it. It's all in the central line or the pick line. The contrast, it will get to the pulmonary trunk a lot faster so again, everything is going to move back. Just be careful of that. So if we have a look at here, again, this is just a few uh, protocols that have been taken. Let's look at a scenario. If you look again at a weight-based CTPA protocol versus, so this is, uh, you know, bolus triggering versus test bolus. So let's say we have a 64 slice or 128 slice CT scanner. It doesn't matter. Your scan time is 40 seconds. Your time to peak is eight seconds and your flow rate is going to be, uh, you know, 4.5 mils a second because you want to give a good angiogram. And say your iodine concentration is going to be 350 density. Now, again, that's we're using a 100 kVP technique. If we use this formula based on the scan time plus time to peak, so 4 plus 8 minus 6, multiply that by the flow rate, you're looking at about 27 mils. If you wanted to use the linear approach, and again, please refer to your local SMPC in terms of dosing for your contrast agents, then you'd actually, you might need more contrast based on a larger body weight. If you have a weight-based protocol, so you start to characterize people uh, into, you know, say 60 to 80 uh, kilos, we'll give them 80 mils, then that's the protocol, that's the volume. So there's a wide variation. So this is the preset volume that you use and this is the formula-based, and this is good to be used for CTPA. 
If we go to thoracic CTA or cardiac CTA and say, you know, our scan time has gone to six seconds, that time to peak is 18 with a flow rate of 4.5, the same concentration. And instead of minusing six, you minus 12, you look at a volume of about 54 mils. And again, if you're using the same technique, and again, please refer to your local SMPC, for your linear approach is 60 mils and weight-based is 81 mils. Again, there's such a wide variation in dosage. But the important factor here is because we're injecting directly into the line, you don't need that extra contrast. You use that same line. And here is another thing. Sometimes they're going to ask you to do a scan just to see the line, if it's fractured or not. So here, this was a paper that was actually published at ECR in 2018 where they looked at this protocol, 100 kVp with a pitch of 1.2. The MA, of course, was 300. And again, rotation time was 0.5 or temporal resolution was less than 0.5. Again, the faster, the better. What they did was they put in 15 mils. The catheter is 15 mils, okay, in volume because you can see this, how much volume is in there. And what then they did was they, they pre-mixed the contrast, 30% contrast, uh, at 15 mils, and then the rest was saline. And all they did was inject it into the line, and then they held it. And then they just did a standard scan. Again, yeah, you can actually see that, you know, the contrast is filled nicely. They used a post-CT chest contrast protocol. But what's interesting here is that look at this thrombus formation right there. This is quite interesting because you don't want high contrast density in the actual catheter when you're doing catheter imaging only, okay? Because if there was, if you have a high density, 100% contrast, you're going to get a massive artifact and we're going to miss this blood clot. And again, thrombosis is a common complication, which we'll talk about in a moment. So when we're talking about complications, you know, the ideal um, positioning of the CVC tip, again, should be in the aorta cable junction. But this is what happens here. A lot of the times, if it's up here or there, when they did this study that was published in 2016, they found out that a third of the rate of thrombosis significantly increases if the tip is at the brachycephalic vein or at the superior vena cava. Now, if it's at the aortocaval junction, the thrombosis rate is between 4.2 to 1.5. And this is where ideally you want to be here. And of course, if it's in the right atrium, it goes to 5.6. So this is why catheter placement is important. And I demonstrated it before to you on the x-rays. Because if your catheter tip is sitting up here in this area at the brachycephalic junction going to the SVC, then you know you're going to have a high rate of thrombosis. This, as you're injecting, you could dislodge a thrombus and you can cause a stroke, number one. Number two, if the thrombus is hardened and you're injecting, Again, you could break it off or you can actually reduce the flow of contrast going into the patient. So these little small subtle things and placement tips have a big impact on the quality of our scans. And usually also when you're looking at, at thrombus, there's different types of thrombus in the lines. You can have thrombus around the, the fibrin sheath. You can have an intraluminal clot, so blood is still stuck in there. They didn't wash it out properly by using a large volume of saline. After the injection, it could have hardened in there, or there could be blood clot in there when they drew back, but they didn't flush it properly. Or you could get mural thrombosis, very, very common as well, or you can get complete blockage. Now, this is then, this is another risk area when injecting into central lines, and it's important when they get a registered nurse or radiologist that they flush it and they check it because then they will determine not just on flushing and checking whether it's safe to go ahead or not. But still, once they've done this, it's still not safe because you need to check your topogram. When we come to check the topogram, sometimes they will flush it and central lines and lines, they can move. So look at this one here, has gone back up the internal jugular vein. So this is a risk. So always check your topograms. Here, again, here is another one that comes straight from uh, the, the central line is coming down. It's mispositioned here. It's going down in the arterial system and not in the venous system. And look at this large area of blood. So this is something so subtle that can really affect our imaging. Here, they've put in a central line, but look what's happened. It's too high up and have caused an hemothorax. 
Okay, again, here is another one. They've come in from the top all the way down and it's too high up. So again, if I look at the Carina, it's right here, 42% chance of thrombus. This is going to be a high risk patient. So this is something we have to be careful when we're injecting. And just because you have the x-ray before does not necessarily mean it hasn't moved when you do the scanogram or the topogram or the tomogram. Once it's there, then you know exactly what you're dealing with. And then sometimes when you, you see that you can't see a proper central line, you'll see it coming up, you can go straight up into the neck. Or sometimes it can actually go down into the wrong area and it can go high up and it'll be dislodged and move backwards because they didn't hold it properly. This is also another concern. So whilst the central line, we always assume it's in the perfect position, it's not. And also watch for kinking. If the actual line kinks on top of each other, then you're increasing pressure and reducing the flow of contrast going through the central line to the patient. Again, here is another one. Look at this child. This is a portacath. Yes, we can inject, but look, the line has dislodged from the connection. So again, if you look at the sagittal plane or the, or the lateral x-ray, it's completely dislodged. So be super careful of this as well when injecting into portacaths. And also when you're injecting into central lines, look at this here. You can see the contrast there, it's, which is good, but be careful of air bubbles. Now, what is the problem here? Because while everyone's flushed everything perfect, there's still air bubbles in the syringes and the lines. That's why it is so important to tilt it down you know, don't tap on the syringe because you'll start affecting the plate of the motor. You, you, you pull back and pull forward in order to re reduce those bubbles and wash those lines with saline. That's why I always recommend using 100 mil saline, filling it up, clear all the bubbles out because any bubbles that go into this area can cause imaging artifacts. And interestingly, 23% of all injections have air in, in, in the pulmonary system because of airs in the x-ray tube, uh, in the um, syringes. So here is another example where you have dislodged lines. So sometimes you'll have your portacath here quite nicely. This is normally what it looks like. Sometimes they can break or sometimes they can move back and go higher up in position. And then sometimes they break and they get dislodged and you do a CT and you see it down there. So be super careful as well for the location, if there's any kinking, if there's any dislodgement and where it's placed exactly for the rate of thrombosis. And in here again, here is another one. Here, this is a distal migration of a Hickman's catheter into a 35-year-old female patient who was on chemotherapy. As you can see, look here, it's below the aorta cable junction. So let's have a look. Here is the um, bifurcation. Two down, okay, maybe it's a little bit lower, but it's still fine. But then look at this here. When I go back up to the carina, it's now two and a half down. It's actually migrated. So sometimes x-rays, depending on the angle of the x-ray, so if you're erect or semi-erect, your tube placements also can play games with you as well with your eyes. That's why I check the tomogram as well. And again, sometimes lines, you think they're sitting at the uh, superior venic cava, but in actual fact, they end up going into the azygous vein. Because the tip was high, and because of the blood supply, it's gone into the azygous vein. So this is where also checking tip position to show the flow of contrast is really, really, really important. And then also when you're looking at secondary mouth position into the contralateral vessel. So normally when we put our central lines, we put one in, that's the way it should be. Sometimes you can go back and go into the opposite direction or they could have what they call is a bilateral SVC. So you could have a right side and a left sided one. So be very careful of this. And this is what points you into this direction here as well. So please check all SMPCs of the catheters before injecting contrast and then check the lines in the topogram. I cannot stress the importance of this because this is a very challenging environment. And as radiographers, radiologists and nurses, the first and most important thing is tip location, two centimeters below the carina. Number two, even more important, check for if there's any kinking or as such. Number three, see if there's anything dislodged from, you know, the porta cuff, it's dislodged or not. Number four, okay, make sure you also, when the nurse or the radiologist is flushing the line, 
How do they feel when they use with their hands? And number five, before doing all of this, go back and check the catheter exactly what it is and look at what they recommend, whether hand injection or power injection, and what is the allowable flow rate of most importantly. And finally, contrast medias all have different viscosity profiles. So please be careful with this. So we've talked about the types of CVC catheters. We've looked at the chest termogram. We've looked at contrast media delivery techniques and we've gone through complications. So please everybody, um, we'll go to the Q&A session now. Um, it was my pleasure presenting uh, on power injectors and central venous catheters. And please uh, go to the Q&A now, write your questions. We will provide you a certificate in two weeks time after you fill up the field back form, okay? And then I'm gonna go through and start looking at the countries that have been saying hello. So we've got Japan, hello Japan. We've also got um, Pakistan, Philippines, Peru, Sydney, Australia, Argentina, Lebanon, South Africa, the United Kingdom, Singapore, Nigeria. Wow, internationally, Philippines again, Italy, buongiorno from Italy, UK, Malaysia, amazing. Um, as we keep going up, we've got Ghana. This is amazing, guys. Thank you so much. And by the way, this is our biggest webinar till date. We've also increased our uh, our attendance, and it's so um, and it's a lot higher now. And we've broken more records. So big thank you for supporting us. Okay, let's go to the Q and A. So, can I use a CT uh, or can I use a central venous catheter if I do a coronary procedure? Yes, you can, providing the first condition that you check the catheter type, the SMPC of the catheter, what allows you for pressure and so forth. So this definitely, yes, you can do it. And then you need to have a radiologist and a nurse flush it and check it. Then you need to also check the tamogram to see if there's any kinking, um, if there's any dislodgement, or if there's any breakages apart. So this is something to pay attention to. If you fulfill all those criteria, you can inject safely and confidently. So thank you so much, uh, Rochelito. I appreciate it. And next one is Jose Roy Rezano. Um, right IV contrast, size, pitch of CT table movement. Can you get the best images? Okay, so whenever you do right side injection, it's always closest to the heart, okay? The pitch of a table, depending if it's a CTA or a routine procedure. So if it's a CTA head and neck, You'd always want to go for a pitch of about 1 to 1.1 maximum. Number two, if you ever want to look at um, anything else uh, other than this, then you would want to go back to your KVP protocol. If you wanted to do port of venous, then you can use 1.3 millimeters of rotation pitch. So thank you so much for that. I, I appreciate it. Uh, Zonia Arshad. Hi, Zonia from Pakistan. What should be the flow rate during a triphasic scan? That's an excellent question. So Zonia, depending if you're going to do a liver triple phase, I always go from uh, 3.5 to 4.5 mils a second, right 20 gauge cubital fossa cannula. This is what I recommend all the time. We also have um, uh, Roldan Salvador. Hi, despite the risk of IV catheter fractures and eventual embolism, what are possible indications for us to take the risk of using a central line for contrast injection. Okay, risk is something you must avoid at every possible cost. You need to go back to your institution's guidelines. Now, if your institution does not have guidelines, then you need to check the catheter. The catheter will always have a guideline. Some of them say do power injection and some say don't. And the ones that do say power injection, you need to follow there very strictly the PSI pressure you put on your injector and the flow rate. If it goes by hand injection, then you use hand injection. If it doesn't say anything at all, which is the third possible uh, uh, possibility, then definitely consult the radiologist and then they will make that decision, definitely. Brielli Fukala, does arms up or arms down affect tip placement uh, for the two variable? Oh. Uh, Briley, thank you so much for that very amazing question. So normally when the patient's at rest states, the hands by the side, normally it's located. 
and usually it's pent. But when I lift their arm up and down, yes, it does move about half a centimeter. But if most of the time with the arms down, they're in the right position, then it's fine to actually inject. So this, Briley, is a fantastic question. Thank you so much for asking this. Uh, Roland uh, Salvador, do you recommend post-contrast scan to be always performed in manual injection? So post-contrast scan, you always should use a power injector in a, in a normal peripheral line, like you know a cannula in the arm, definitely, because you get consistent contrast media delivery. And thank you all so very much. Uh, it's always my pleasure to serve you and the entire radi radiology community, uh, Roldan. We have another one, um, uh, Tunga Mirashi Buvute. I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Do you have a hand flush, a pick after contrast injection, even if the pump had salon flush at the end? And that's an amazing question. So that really depends on the nurse, if there is or is not a heparin block. Now, if you're using at least a 50 to 100 mil salon flush, it's fine. But again, you need to go back and speak to the nurse and doctor and they will tell you how to do it. Because ultimately, when you're injecting uh, contrast and then 100 mils of saline, and remember, these volumes are about 16 mils and you've injected about 60 mils, you've flushed it perfectly. So it's really up to the nurse, but you discuss this with the nurse. But thank you so much. That was an excellent question. Hafiza Hira Shazadi, uh, can we use CVC for giving contrast? And what are the indications? Yes, Hafiza, you can give uh, contrast in a CVC, providing you meet the conditions. Condition number one, what type of CVC is it? You need to check the documentation. What's the maximum pressure? What's the maximum flow rate that's allowed? If they allow you to inject. If they don't, then you have to do hand injection. If none of those two, then you can't proceed with the test. You go back to the radiologist, of course. So yes, Hafiza, you, again, you're not... We as healthcare practitioners, doctors, radiographers, nurses, and everyone else, we cannot inject in a line until you go back to that company because they dictate what we can and can't do because they've tested it for safety. The last thing you want to do is inject in a line that's not allowed to be injected and you split catheters or there's thrombus everywhere and it gives a patient a stroke or it can dislodge a catheter. So this is why it's really important. So thank you, Hafiza, for that excellent question. Um, Thalabi Kumalo, which contrast media is the most preferred in CTPA? Look, you know, again, I can't give uh, in this session, this is an education session. What I will advise, I cannot tell you which is the best one, but what I will advise is check the two things, the viscosity profile and the safety profile. These are the two most important things, and that's how you will make your decision. Now, in order for CTPA to make the best studies, use 100 kVp you get increased of um, Hounsford unit density by 25%. It's amazing. Um, Lexander Lex, uh, thank you for your question and hello from Hong Kong. Is all hyperallergenic contrast safe to use for high sensitivity to allergies? Unfortunately, I cannot answer this question, but I will take this question and if you can send me an email and I'll get our medical representative from Gerbe to reach out to you and answer that question. But thank you for that question. And I'm sorry I couldn't answer it. Uh, Emmanuel Adu, um, if the IVC is cannulated, can you do a CTPA with it? Um, so if the, of course you can. So sometimes you will have lines in the IVC. It's the exact same principle as the SVC. And again, you'd want it to be sitting outside the right atrium. And of course, uh, definitely you can do it. And if anything, you get better results because the vascular volume in the IVC is way larger. So the cross-sectional area of contrast in there is a lot more. So when it goes to the heart, you actually get better studies. And you'll be quite surprised. The best CTAs actually come from patients with central lines, so whether in the SVC or IVC. So thank you, Emmanuel, for that. I appreciate it. Uh, Sedamin Odin, do you recommend flushing the catheter with heparin after use to prevent uh, thrombus risk? I cannot answer this because, again, this comes back to your uh, institution's practice and what they've done on the ward with your patient. So unfortunately, you need to consult the nurse and the radiologist in your department, and you need to actually, and then they will go back and consult the referring physicians and they'll make that decision. So I cannot give an answer on this, but thank you for that question. I'm sorry I couldn't answer it for you. As you can see, everybody, uh, we have a lot of controversial, this is a very controversial topic. 
And we're glad at Gerbe, we know what we can educate, but we also know there are limitations in everything that we do, only because you want to ensure the safety of your patient. Great. All right. Um, can we, oh, Hafiza has sent another one. Can we use CVC for MRI? Of course you can, as long as the, uh, again, you'd have to go through the safety process to see it's MRI compatible, if it's MRI compatible. And then we go back and we look at the three conditions, check the type of catheter. If you do hand injection or mechanical injection and it's cleared by the radiologist and nurse, by all means, you can go ahead because this is your institution's practice. As long as you follow your institution's practice, that's the most important thing. Um, would I, uh, uh, Iljan Masati, would I recommend or prefer a specific type of contrast to administer through lines? Again, I can't answer that question. Again, look at the viscosity profile of the contrast uh, that, you, uh, that you want to use and also their safety profile. And that's the best I can do to answer that. I'm sorry to say that. Um, uh, Guari Ashwal Rawat, how much flow rate is recommended in pediatric patients with central venous catheters? Again, the flow rate is not dictated by me or by anybody else. It's dictated by the catheter that is approved at that flow rate. Because if your catheter, if you put a higher flow rate, which causes more pressure, you could potentially split it, break it and dislodge it or push off blood clots. So definitely you need to go back and look at the catheter type and what allows you to do it and not do it at all. So again, I'm sorry, it goes back to the catheter. Add your institution's practice because this dictates everything on how you get to move forward. How do you avoid beam hardening artifact while injecting through the central line? Again, so uh, Ahmad Atta, thank you so much for that question. So remember we said that use 30% contrast, 70% saline, you mix that up in a syringe and then the nurse will inject it for the volume of that line. And again, you'll go back and it'll tell you how much is the residual volume in that line. So thank you for that excellent question. Um, Andrew Ekazimi, uh, this is an interesting question and every webinar we do get this. How do you flush with saline when using a single syringe power injector? My dear friend, um, you can do it potentially, but we don't recommend this practice at all. You need an injector with two syringes because if you put contrast and saline and you tip it down, we know that contrast is heavier than water, but also there's, there's potential mixing that could happen there. And when you're injecting, depending on the pressure and flow rate, and, you, and you're predicting a volume. So you're not going to be able to reduce contrast volume as well. So you have to say, okay, I've got to give 100 mils of contrast, then 100 mils of saline, and then inject. Whatever happens, you're injecting 100 mils of contrast. So this is where the limitations begin. So ideally, you'd want to use a dual pump system. Um, Muhammad Riaz Kurashi, thank you for your question. Recently, I performed a both upper limb angio using the catheter via the IJV the patient was admitted and has multiple morbidity what must be the ideal flow rate again in the presentation we said that you don't inject into the internal jugular vein unless it's supervised by a radiologist or a nurse and the radiologist will tell you what flow rate is appropriate i cannot give that answer because again in the presentation we showed that the literature you should not inject uh, via an injector into the internal jugular vein because the risk of extravasation and danger is very high in the neck area and that's something to be careful of. So this I cannot answer. You must refer back to your practices. But, uh, but what I will say, do not inject into the IJV unless you have uh, a radiologist and then they take full responsibility and authority on how they go about it. Um, I just, oh, there's thousands of questions. Thank you all so much. And by the way, we've got more than 1,500 attendees. This is the biggest ever that we've had people online at any time. So thank you all so much and for staying around for the Q&A. Um, we have an excellent question actually here. Now, I'm sorry if I'm going to say the name incorrectly. Damishka Sanaka Nadesari Hewa, do you recommend manual injection? Again, it really comes back to the type of procedure. If you're doing a CTA versus a routine chest and the doctor said you must go ahead and do a hand injection and it allows it after checking the catheter, then it's fine. Definitely, yes. But again, 
only through your institution's guidelines that you follow very strictly. Um, oh, Mr. Joel Vincent from Australia. Hello, sir, my good friend. Uh, Joel asks, is it a must to take a chest X-ray PA just after the pick insertion, even though we take a shot while the patient is lying in fluoro table? Uh, Joel, this is a fantastic question, and I totally say yes. Because when you take a shot, the actual line is not fixed to the patient's skin because, you know, usually they put in um, uh, surgical, um, you know, measures to actually tape it down to the skin. That can move. That's why you need it. Secondly, you can't see small pneumothoraxes on fluoroscopy. You can see them better on an X-ray. So, Joel, this is the best I can answer, and definitely you should. Um, anonymous attendee asks a question. Are there any internal jugular vein central lines which are power injectable? Um, look, again, the vascular cath one that I showed you can be inserted into the jugular vein and it has a power pick in the middle, the purple one, and it shows you the maximum flow rate. So anonymous, thank you so much for that question. Again, it all comes back to which line and what the line allows you to do to put it in there. Um, Another amazing question by Carol Thomas. Is a drawback necessary when testing the line? Now, let me tell you, drawback should only be done by a nurse or radiologist because they are trained to do this, not by radiographers or technologists. However, if you are in your institution trained and allowed to do it, then by all means. Again, it goes back down to the protocol that allows it and usually vascular surgery and interventional radiologists they should be consulted regarding this. It's an excellent question, Carol. As you can all see, these are very controversial questions and the answers all lead back to what type of catheter is being used, what is allowed by the manufacturer and what is your institution's guidelines. And if those three are met and you want to proceed, then you need to check the topogram. Okay. Um, this is another question by Wisdom Aya Kepa. I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. How does the choice between power injectors and manual injection techniques impact the administration of contrast agents during CTPA? Considering factors such as injection rate, dispersion, safety. So this is an excellent question. So Wisdom, what I recommend is you always use a power injection in a peripheral venous catheter in your arm, not the central lines of catheter, because you maintain consistent flow rates. People don't realize that an injector, when you inject, provides a consistent flow rate and pressure. Whereas if you do a hand injection, you can get a big, tall person like myself or a very small person, and we all have different pressures and ability to push contrast in lines. And that's going to have a variation in flow rate. So this is why consistency, consistent contrast media delivery is paramount. So thank you, Wisdom. Um, Anonymous attendee, do you recommend a post-examination scat image to ensure the catheter is still in place post-scan? So anonymous, thank you so much. Normally, uh, you would actually see this on the, the scan itself because usually most of the times it's a chest CT. And if it's abdominal, you can still see on the scanogram, but usually it's fine because you'll know the position with the hand raised. Uh, Joson Ayusu, does the CT scan slice affect the flow rate? Well, in this day and age, anything above uh, 16 slice CT scanners, there's no effect at all. Anything below that, yes, there is an effect. So if I was to do a CTPA on a four slice or a 16, I'd only get 3.5 mils a second only. Um, another one from Emmanuel Adu. Thank you for your question. How much monitoring delay do you recommend for a test bolus when using CTPA? For the central line, it's immediate. And if it's non, if it's just through a normal venous line, uh, a venous catheter in the arm, uh, again, five seconds is pretty good. Okay, excellent. Um, oh, here's a really good question by Hashith Chatarunga Magala Kota. Sir, can we use CVC to administer radio pharmaceuticals also? Now, this I cannot answer. You must go back and you must consult the radiologist and the nuclear medicine uh, doctor as well because when you're injecting radio pharmaceuticals, again, they have a half-life. And if the contrast, uh, if, and if the radio pharmaceutical stays in there, it's contaminated, its half-life is a lot higher. 
So this I do not know, and you must consult with your uh, your local guidelines in your department. Maybe we have one more two questions. Um, Hafiza uh, Shahazi has asked another question. In MRI for giving contrast media, can we use a CVC? Absolutely. Again, if providing, if you fulfill the criteria of the type of catheter, it's been cleared and so forth. Okay. Ah, oh, here's another question I want to answer. Now, this is a little bit off topic, but it's something that's really important, and, and I think I should answer it. This is from Nuzubi Vitus Unigubi. What would you do if you fail to get the best result for a CTPA? Do you repeat the scan? Ah, oh, that's an amazing question. So last year, we had a great webinar on this. There's one key principle. When you do your CTPA, if your Hounsford unit in the pulmonary trunk is more than 250 Hounsford units, the amount of risk that you put on the radiologist is about 1% of not seeing it. If it's below 250 Hounsford units, you should repeat the scan. That is as simple as it gets. So thank you so much for that excellent question. Uh, okay, one more question. There's a lot of single uh, injector questions, guys. It's time to contact your local teams for double injectors. Um, Oh, here's another question. This is from Motsanapi Tishwana. Thank you for your question. Is it ideal to use 300 milligram per mil of iodine for CT angio instead of 350? Well, in CT, using a 350 density definitely gives you better results with a lower KV peak because remember we showed you the K edge of contrast. If you were to use a 300, you'd have to use 80 KV peak. And remember, it's all about quantitatively how you measure the Hounsford unit and if it's applicable to the radiologist. That's a really good question. So thank you so much for that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, there's so many more questions I'd love to answer, but our time is up. So I want to thank you all so much for attending today's webinar. A big thank you to everyone around the world. I'm seeing more and more and more people. Um, I, I'm seeing Sri Lanka. I'm seeing the US. I'm seeing Taiwan, Trinidad and Tobago, Kuwait. Um, I'm seeing a lot more people. I'm seeing UAE. I'm seeing Dubai. I'm seeing India. Hello to our friends in India. Um, Australia again, Singapore. And a big thank you to each and every one of you. for And Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, and also Latin America. I'm seeing people uh, in and Chile, Argentina. So a big thank you. So a big thank you to watching our webinar tonight on Power Injectors and central venous catheters, principles, techniques, and applications. Once again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us on our email. And remember, all Gobe product indications are as per approved by the country's regulatory authorities. So please refer to your local SMPC or contact the local Gobe team if you need further product information. And just a reminder, we are accredited by the four big societies, the ISRRT, ASRT, the Society of Radiographers and the Australian Society of Medical Imaging and Radiation Therapy. We will send you a certificate in two weeks' time after you have completed the feedback form, and that is the QR code at the end. Also, a recording to this webinar, we will send it out to you after three months because it does need time to do editing and get it ready to put it up on the website. So once again, it's a big thank you. Thank you all so much for providing so much care to your patients. From Gerbe to all of you around the world, we all really appreciate the amazing work you're doing with your patients. And thank you for being our superheroes in medicine. And from me, it's goodbye for now.
Recording stopped.